pleasure to uh, be here this morning. Oops. I'm going to start with the uh, raising the question, are, are fossil fuels evil? You would think so. Uh, CO2 emissions and fossil fuels are blamed for literally everything, warm weather, cold weather, excessive snowfall or lack thereof, excessive rain and flooding or drought, hurricanes and tornadoes, great lakes rising or falling, and so on and, and so forth. It's, it's uh, almost like a religion. You know, whatever happens, instead of being God's will, it's caused by climate change. Uh, I challenge you to read any, any edition of the Washington Post and New York Times, even the Wall Street Journal, uh, any problems we're having in this country, 99% of the time, it's, somehow it's, it's due to, uh, to climate, uh, climate change, fossil fuels, CO2, so they must be evil, right? As Arnold Schwarzenegger said, Biggest evil is fossil fuels. Well, if fossil fuels are, are evil, what does this imply? Well, 29 states and D.C. have implemented mandated CO2 reduction goals. Uh, Democratic presidential candidate Jay Inslee, among others, uh, plans to end U.S. oil and gas production. We just heard about the, uh, the New Green Deal. New York, Chicago, Atlanta, and dozens of other cities have plans to reduce or eliminate CO2 emissions and fossil fuels. California, which is, by the way, the world's sixth largest economy, wants to virtually eliminate fossil fuels, as does uh, Germany. Maybe the problem uh, is not fossil fuels. Maybe the problem is capitalism, according to Naomi Klein from uh, Rutgers. And she should know. She's the expert. Her title is the Gloria Steinem Chair in Media, Culture, and Feminist Studies. You can't make this stuff up. <laughs> We're laughing, but, but these are the people that want to dictate our energy and economic futures. What are some energy realities? Fossil fuels drive economic growth and jobs. Fossil fuels provide over 80% of world energy and will continue to do so. Renewable energies can provide only a small portion of world energy. Proposals to drastically reduce fossil fuels and GHG emissions, and there seems to be a new proposal coming out almost every day, would devastate the U.S. and world economies. The 2015 Paris Agreement wants to uh, reduce fossil fuel emissions, uh, GHGs, to 80 to 95 percent below 1990 levels by 2050 not below what projected 2050 levels are estimated to be, but below actual 1990 levels. And that's important to keep in mind, so I'll come back to it in a, uh, in a minute. These proposals are uh, impossible, ludicrous, uh, they're, they're ridiculous, they would call, cause economic and social catastrophe. As uh, the noted Professor Dick Lal at uh, UCLA has stated, Fossil fuels reduce poverty. I can't say it any better than that. What have fossil fuels done for us lately? They've uh, created modern society. They've facilitated the successive industrial revolutions, including the one currently occurring in the 21st century, created the modern world we live in, permit current high quality of life. And, uh, over the past 250 years, global life expectancy has increased more than twofold. Population has increased Eightfold incomes have increased 11 folds, 11 fold. And over this period, uh, fossil fuel derived uh, CO2 emissions have increased somewhat as well. There have been literally thousands of studies uh, conducted uh, that link energy and economic growth. Energy is required for economic growth, economic growth depends critically on, on um, energy availability. Again, most of that energy is fossil fuels. As distinguished professor Vaclav Smil has said, ours is a high energy civilization based largely on fossil fuels. Um, energy use and output are tightly coupled 
Uh, an enormous increase in energy supply will be required to meet the demands of projected population growth and lift the world uh, out of uh, poverty. Uh, we cannot have reductions in poverty, economic growth, improved living standards in the developed world or the developing world without massive amounts of fossil fuels. For example, over the past 100 years or so, 200 years, uh, this graph simply shows the uh, close relationship between GDP increases, population increases, life expectancy, and CO2 emissions. Uh, basically, as fossil fuels uh, have, have come, come on board, come online, CO2 emissions have increased, but uh, world GDP has, has exploded almost exponentially. Population has increased, and uh, wealth and well-being has increased. More interestingly, prior to about 1750, there was virtually no, no growth, uh, economic growth in the, uh, in the world for the previous thousand years. With the introduction of uh, the first industrial revolution and the, the beginning of the utilization of fossil fuels, economic growth uh, took off. Again, this has been shown in literally thousands of studies. As Professor Robert Ayers has said, the economic system is essentially a system for extracting, processing, and transferring energy. So what, is, what does this tell us? That, well, there's a, a strong correlation and, more importantly, a causal relationship between world GDP and uh, CO2 emissions. This is what it looks like over the past 100 years or so. Um, CO2 emissions uh, have gone up, and so also has world uh, GDP. Even the World Bank recognizes that access to energy is absolutely fundamental in the struggle against poverty. This is the forecast from the uh, U.S. Energy Information Administration, the reference case forecast for world GDP through 2050, over basically the next uh, 30 years. Uh, a real, G real GDP, in terms of real dollars, will increase threefold, from about 100 trillion to about 300 trillion. And in 2050, according to uh, the U.S. Energy Information Administration, the International Energy Agency, and any other, every other reputable forecast, fossil fuels will, as they are today, be providing well over 80 percent of the world's energy. Uh, again, to get to get this accelerated and continuing economic growth worldwide, we're going we're gonna to need continue to need an awful lot of fossil fuels. So, plotting the uh, relationship between CO2 emissions and fossil fuels over the next 30 years, this is what it, uh, what it looks like. Um, as I said, fossil fuels will continue to provide well over 80% of the world's energy supply and renewable energy, despite the fact it's increasing in percentage terms, will only be able to supply a small portion of the world, the world energy supply. This is not my opinion or my forecast. This, again, this is EIA, this is IEA, this is any and every reputable uh, economic and energy forecast that has been made. So we heard uh, earlier about, about the social cost of carbon. So what I've done here is looking just at the economic benefits of fossil fuels. Forget about the trillions of dollars that the increase uh, in agriculture uh, has, has given us. Just looking at the, the economic benefits of fossil fuels compared to the interagency working group's estimates of the social cost of carbon, then depending on what discount you, you rate you use, it almost doesn't make any difference. The benefit cost ratios are anywhere from 70 to 1 to 250 to 1. Now, in traditional benefit cost analysis, uh, benefit cost ratio you know, above one is good. When you get in the range of two or three, it's outstanding. Here we're talking about 70 to one, 100 to one, 250 to one. So in terms of benefits and cost, uh, uh, there's little argument uh, that the, the, the societal, social costs, social benefits of fossil fuels vastly outweigh by orders of magnitude any potential cost, even if you believe 
the cost estimated by the interagency working group, uh, which as, as we've just heard are a, a bit uh, suspect and I, I think they're ridiculous, but even accepting, accepting that, there's still the, the benefit cost ratios, the benefits of social, social benefits of fossil fuels out, are, outweigh the perceived cost by orders of magnitude. I earlier mentioned uh, the, uh, the um, goals or, or mandates. What the Paris uh, Agreement wants to do is to reduce world GHG emissions by 2050 to 10 percent of what they were in 1990. Now, the, what these three graphs here are, 1990 actual, 2015 actual, and 2050 forecast as forecast under the reference case by EIA. Note that we're not talking about reduction 10 percent of forecast. We're talking about a reduction of 10 percent of what they were back in 1990. So what we're really talking about here, and if, and if, you, if you retain anything from my presentation this morning, this is one of two things I want you to keep in mind. The reductions we talk about are so ludicrous we're talking about reducing anticipated or forecast GHG emissions and fossil fuel use, by the way, by 96% of what they're forecast to be under the reference case in the year 2050. You're essentially eliminating fossil fuels by 2050. Uh, it is a, you know, it's absolutely absurd, ridiculous, ludicrous goal. As Bill Gates has said, if you could pick just one thing to reduce poverty, by far you would pick energy, and that's one thing I agree with the founder of Market Microsoft about. What does this imply for world GDP, world economic growth, world being, world being? Well, the first bar on the left, the red bar, is, is the current per capita GDP worldwide. The Second red bar is what it is forecast to be in the year 2050 under the EIA reference case. If we reduce GHG emissions, CO2 emissions, and fossil fuel use by 96% of what it's supposed to be in 2050, these are, these are the goals I mentioned from the Paris, Paris Agreement and other, other treaties, quote unquote, You'll see where, where the world GDP and economic well-being will be in 2050. It'll be equivalent to what the uh, United Kingdom and the U.S. had about 200 years ago, back to the 1800s. That's the kind of reduction in GDP and living standards we're, we're talking about. More forcefully, what does it mean for the U.S.? The first yellow bar to the left is the uh, 2050 U.S. medium household income estimated to be. The second yellow bar is the, the current U.S. household medium uh, income, a little bit above $50,000 a year. Under the scenario I just described, a reduction in CO2 emissions and fossil fuel use, 96% by 2050, 2050 U.S. medium income would be about $300 a month, or about $3,600, $3,700 a year. What is that? That's, that's way below the, the current poverty level. It, it's, it's way below the uh, current minimum wage level. It, it's, it's, uh, it's death. It's starvation. Uh, it, 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 uh, even if you, you double that to $600 a month, try living on, you know, try living on $300 or $600 a month. Those are the implications of massive reductions in uh, CO2 emissions and fossil fuels over the next 30 years. That's why I say they're, they're, they're absurd, they're ludicrous, they're, they're ridiculous, they're impossible. But that is what uh, we seem to be heading for, unfortunately. To conclude, fossil fuels and CO2 emissions are demonized and blamed for everything. 
However, CO2 derives from fossil fuels, which are essential to modern life and will remain so in the future. To reduce 2050 greenhouse gas emissions to 95% below actual 1990 levels by 2050 would imply that 2050 living, world living standards would be reduced to the levels of the 1800s. The benefit cost ratios between fossil fuels benefits and the social cost of carbon are high, very high, and will remain orders of magnitude larger than any reasonable social cost of carbon estimate. Most importantly, perhaps, policies designed to artificially reduce fossil fuel use will do much more harm than good and must be avoided. Fossil fuels will continue to be essential to U.S. and world economies and jobs. Finally, the societal benefits of fossil fuels far outweigh costs by orders of magnitude and will continue to do so. Thank you.